hello everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the Dan Nestle Show. I'm your host, Dan Nestle. How often do you see an ad or get one of those dreaded LinkedIn emails or maybe even meet someone at an event and get hammered with a capital M message? You know what I mean? The kind of marketing language that bombards you with like a litany of reasons why a brand or a product or a person is totally great, except to you, it's totally irrelevant, uninteresting or uninspired. So many companies and people still don't get the fact that nobody wants to hear you talk about yourself. At least not before you established a relationship and understood what your audience is all about. So why haven't brands learned their lesson? Well, my guest today has made it his business to show his clients why it's hard to talk about their business and what they can do about it. He's a 25 plus year marketer and branding pro who has routinely saved his employers and clients from branding disasters and helped them transform their businesses along the way. He's the founder and principal of marketing firm Verrett and Associates and the official elevator pitch repairman. Please welcome to the show, Mike Verrett. Mike, it is good to see you. How are you doing? Dan, it is an absolute pleasure. And I don't think I've ever had anybody introduce me as an elevator repairman before. I really like that. That's a good angle. <laughs> well, you know, you you do have the elevator pitch repair as one of your, you know, as something I think incredible that we need to talk about that you've designed. Yep. And 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 I love the way that you frame that up and we're going to get into it because, you know, people think of an elevator pitch and naturally, you know, when your elevator breaks, what do you do? You call the repairman. Um, and, you know, I, I am, I am just, we've talked about this before. The way that you do that is certainly well beyond the simple title of repairman. I think though that, that you fix things, you get the job done, and then people can go up and down again at will uh, with their messaging. But that's something we'll get to in, in, in a little bit. I'm just really happy to, ha to to have you here. Like we were introduced by um, Karina Bell um, again, and my get my listeners will know that I talk about the Connective a lot. So we have uh, this this organization called the Connective. It's uh, a lot, you know professionals who are you know networking, introducing uh, one another to uh, to different business opportunities and to other people. And you know it's just a, a fabulous group of of individuals who have who have great backgrounds, great stories. Um, and it's a fertile ground for me to grab uh, podcast guests. So, you know, I, I love it in that way. But uh, Karina introduced me to Mike and, you know, we, we had a chat, hit it off. I really wanted to get him on the show. You know, we, um, we do talk a lot about marketing on the show, but recently we haven't that much. Like recently there's not been a lot of deep marketing talk. And, um, Did you, you know, it's like the morning soap operas instead. Yeah, we shifted yeah. to the, to, we shift topics, we move around, but... But I am, you know, I, I'm really happy to have a real marketer on the show again. And because, um, you know, that's what I do, marketing and communications. Of course. So, um, yeah, man, let's let's just have fun. I, I'd like everybody to know first, you know, what got you to where you are? How did you get to, to uh, Verrett and Associates um, from, you know, your humble beginnings? Well, it all started about 25 some odd years ago when I decided I'm going to go into the advertising agency business and start working at an agency in my 20s. And if you go 18 years forward, I was still in some agency capacity. Throughout my time in the agency world, I was on the client service side. Now, anyone who knows the agency knows that uh, agency world knows that client service sort of has the stigma on the creative side, like you're just the note passer. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, that's how client service is applied. Here's the creative. What do you think? We'll pass it back to them. I always had a knack of speaking client, producer, creative, didn't matter. I, yeah. I could adapt the conversation and, and keep it relevant just by understanding, okay, their perspective is this, mine's this, to meet them halfway. But that's just something that I always did. It wasn't anything yeah. different. Well, well, when and, you say client service, just to be clear for, for my listeners, you know, we're talking about like what you typically see, typically see as an account director or account leader. Um, or, you know, account executive, you know, in the earlier days. So exactly. that's, that's really where you're at, right? Yeah, okay. And project exactly. manager. Yes. Thank you for account. Account service now is a little bit different in the agency yeah. world is very different. We can even talk about that. But yeah. my life was the agency world, whether it was promotional marketing, advertising agency, digital agency, that's the world that I lived in. Yeah. And eventually it brought me to an agency at the time it was called Uproar and it was a kid targeted division of DDB Needham, which is a big agent, a gigantic mm -hmm. agency. They hired me to work on the Hasbro account and the agency's based in Dallas. Hasbro is in Rhode Island where I am. 
So I was working on site for five years on the boys toys business. So wait a second. Can I, can I just interrupt one second? Cause, cause this is interesting. You said that they put you on the kids, kids clients, right? Or the, 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 um, the kids business. So right into, into Hasbro, what was it about you that, that they said, okay, this guy's got to be in toys. Well, I had Hasbro games as a client, which helped. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I was mentioned in good, in a good way, in kind words from people in Hasbro games to the agency. I see. And that's where sort of the connection came from. But the, the trait that they were reacting to is what I hadn't realized yet. It was my ability to talk to the games client and then the games developer and then the CFO or the COO and be able to get the same message across on their wavelength, like pivot from one type mm-hmm. of communication or person to the next for the communication. That's what I was good at. And that's what I always did. So now I'm at Hasbro on site for five years, working on the boys' toys business. And this is, you know, handling the TV commercial development for Transformers and Marvel and G.I. Joe and all of these properties that I grew up with. You know, it's like a dream come true for me. Then they hire me. And I go from, I'm the agency guy who sits there full time to I'm now on the global brand management team of Transformers responsible for global marketing. Now, the first thing to understand about this transition is, is this. Everyone in that, it's a Fortune 500 manufacturing company. Everyone has an MBA. Everyone is driven. They would eat their young to get ahead. To get to, they would climb over you to get ahead. They are driven to climb the corporate ladder. Here comes me from the side Mm -hmm. door coming out of the agency world. I don't know, up from down. They put me on marketing for Transformers then tell me, you need product experience. So we're going to put you on Jurassic World. Okay. Making plastic dinosaurs. (laughs) You were the licensee to make the toys to put on the shelf at Walmart. Mm -hmm. I hated it because product management is basically project management and getting all of this stuff done on a timeline. That's not who I am. I don't think that way. I wasn't educated to think that way either. Sure. I, that wasn't my background. I was like a fish out of water on everything. Then they moved me to Hasbro Games, and I was ready to leave at the end of, of my Jurassic World time, making dinosaurs. That sounds yeah. ridiculous. I should be happy about making dinosaurs. I was ready to go, but they moved me over to Hasbro Games and quickly realized that the thing that I could do to help the business the most was to talk about it. They would put me in front. We would do a global sales meeting every year where in June, all of the regions would have people come in and we'd have, say, you know, a thousand people. We'd do the same three hour presentation for next year's product line seven times. And Mm -hmm. I sort of took creative control of the games one just for games. Okay. Monopoly, shoots and ladders, all of those are part of the portfolio. And I basically turned it into like our games are supposed to be fun. And a lot of the games we were showing, the new games were like messy, like whipped cream based and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Watched a game called yeah. My Face. I turned it into an episode of The Tonight Show and I was the host, but no interviews and just stupid human tricks. Think of it that way. We built a four yeah. foot replica of the game Pie Face that held like half a can of whipped cream on the hand. And we had people come in and play. Like we'd have them come up and play during the presentation. This is how we were demonstrating the games larger than life. So like people, so, so employees and people from around the world who are, who are, who are coming in to see this, they're, yep. they're in suits or whatever it is at Hasbro, at Hasbro and they come and get pie in the face. Yep. Now Terrific. That is a challenge in itself, right? <laughs> but here's the, here's the trick. I knew that when Latin America comes in, it is going to be an absolute cyclone of activity. They talk, they yell, they jump up Mm -hmm. and down and move from one place to another to talk to people. And every single one of them is going to want to come up and get hit with whipped cream. I know that going in. So, of course, I'm going to inflame the situation. (laughs) (laughs) Then the European teams come through. Three different teams, Northern, Central, Mm -hmm. Central Europe, let's say. I know that they want to see the GM get hit with whipped cream. The person who has made their lives miserable for the last six months or whatever. We want to see him. So I knew that ahead of time. I knew I was going to call this guy up and say it's revenge time for everybody. (laughs) 
then Asia comes in and they yeah. want to see everybody get hit with whipped cream as long as it's none of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, that makes so much sense. They're wildly entertained by us getting hit by whipped cream. Yeah. So I knew that going in. I knew how to temper our delivery of what we were doing based on the cultures that were coming in. Hang on just a second. That's a that's an interesting point. I've had some some cross cultural specialists on the show, and you know, as as my listeners know, I spent 16 years in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm you know somewhat of a by many standards, people might call we call me worldly. I, I don't necessarily feel that way, but you know, I'm I'm ultimately just some guy from Jersey. But, uh, you know, look, I, I spent plenty of time in uh, Asian cultures and a lot of it certainly, you know, has rubbed off on me. I have, I have some cultural kind of foibles that are a little odd for Americans and that sometimes land me in some sort of not necessarily trouble, but like questioning and quizzical glances from my uh, superiors um, or my colleagues. So I can imagine a whole room full of like of, of Japanese, for example, uh, just not definitely not wanting to stand up and get pie in the face. Uh, but but if somebody breaks that and goes forward, then everybody would. Or you start kind of introducing perhaps uh, a beer element into the room, and then then there's then there's cake pie everywhere. So it's like you know, and very quickly. But um, you you learn to deal with all these. Diff- How did you learn to deal with all these different cultures in in your role? Um, to me, it was a general understanding that I could apply as a a way of thinking. Okay, mm-hmm. so. I'll give you an example. I understand fundamentally that the market in the market in Asia for Hasbro games is about education. That's developmentally in Asia. They use it more as a developmental mm-hmm. tool than they do for like sit around and play shoots and ladders or Candyland. It serves a different purpose. I know that about that market simply because of cultural preferences that I understand too. Mm-hmm. Right? I can go back to the idea of the Karate Kid 2 <laughs> and the idea of saving face and yeah. honor and apply that thinking on the fly. So now put it in the environment of, get this, Nuremberg, Germany. Oh, geez. Toy Fair. That's where it is every year at this massive, it makes like the Javits Center in New York City, the convention center. That's one tiny wing of this place. And I'm not kidding. It's out of control big. That is the European toy fair. Every country came through with their Hasbro sales rep. And when I saw the sales rep, I knew what country they were from. If it's, let's say, Holland or the Benelux region was like Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Okay, Mm. Those people have a certain sort of way of thinking. Germany has a different way. The UK, I know, is going to be a little bit more droll. I'm picking up on that stuff as they're coming up to me. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot to do with just understanding an audience. That's what really came out of it. My job for three years, for almost four years, was face of Hasbro Games. They'd put me on a plane and fly me to places like Nuremberg, Germany for that, or Hong Kong Toy Fair I would go to every year. They sent me to a brand summit so basically present hasbro games to the asia pacific team at a yoga retreat three hours east of mumbai in a rainforest like when would i ever end up going there the reason they sent me was because i was good at talking about what we did i related to the audience the right way now we get to fall 18 stock is down they let 10 percent of the workforce go happens Mm. all the time i'm the first person called in gaming games and i hugged the vp when i was when i was called i felt like i was being released from prison because yes it was fun to go to hong kong mumbai whatever but when i was in the office i was right back to just oh i couldn't stand it i just didn't want to be there i didn't get any fulfillment out of it yeah when they let me go it did a remarkable thing first of all it gave me freedom to think for a change and not just live in the day, right? I was free of the burden of going to a place I didn't like. Even something like that is impactful in that moment. But what it allowed me to do is look back on 25 years of my career and figure out what the hell I was doing that was consistent through it. And also on top of this, you think about the fact that, yes, I changed jobs, I worked at Hasbro, whatever, but I also met a girl 
bought a condo or got married, bought a condo, had two kids, moved to Rhode Island. Life is going on too. Yeah. This is the first time in 25 years that I was able, they gave me severance. But what I read that at is, is time to think. And I thought back on my career of 25 years and realized that I've done everything in the marketing spectrum at this point, mm-hmm. from concepting a physical product and getting it built, to writing and executing the marketing plan to do it, to writing and acting in the commercial. I've had to do all of that, but so have a lot of other people. Yeah. What enabled me to do it was my understanding of an audience. And that's what I saw as the red thread that ran through my career. What I was best at was relating an idea to an audience on their terms. And that became exactly how I thought about everything. How do you take what you do, like say as a business, and translate that into something that your audience is going to find the meaning in? And that's what I always looked at. My my communication skills were just what I figured that's why I was in account management and account. Mm-hmm. Account executive. That's why I was on a plane going to places like. Did you ever do any of those like assessments to find out what your, you know, what your your skills and strengths were, like the strengths finders and all that kind of stuff? And I'm sure that it came out to like woo and, um, of those of those assessments. Yeah, because I've done all of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> the oh gosh, assessment. which one? Disc, D-I-S. Oh, sure, I know disc, yeah. That's yeah. an easy one to talk about, and it's easy. Mm-hmm. It versus like Myers-Briggs, where they plot you. Yeah, all that, the, uh, the NTJ stuff, yep. yep. Right. In every version of any assessment, I'm a nut, like 99% I. Yeah, that makes sense. It does. Yeah. But I have the ability to apply to all of them, to, to um, sort of bend to all of them. So I actually have like a 50% line on the other one. Interesting. Yeah, not quite, really, but I have the presence of all those other ones. Considering one is a spike. Yeah. So you're you're very high on the influence, and and um, that does that's not surprising if the, if your job has been, or you know, it, it it sounds like you just gravitated towards that intercommunication, interpersonal communications um, from early on, and you know, learned what worked through. Sounds like almost trial and error, and you just got in front of people and just made it happen. Like it's not like you you took courses or read how to influence you know friends and how to win friends and influence people or or any of that stuff. So no, like no secret. It it came down to um, no, there wasn't a secret. It was yeah. it's more like an empathetic trigger. Like how am I going to connect with someone? Takes several different pieces of that disc assessment, right? If it's an S, somebody who's like, how are you feeling? Can't we all get along? Let's work this out. I need to really think about this and feel how I feel about it, right? I can pick up on if somebody's an S. I can pick up on if somebody's a C. I can pick up on if someone's a D and immediately adapt. And I can do it quickly. It's just, I guess it's how my mind works. I have no idea. Sounds like it's probably something that the the way that you grew up, um, something happens, you know, something the way that you you were raised or you had, you know, in your family and your never met my father, you'd see the similarities, put it that way. Oh, really? The way, the way his um college friend, but mm-hmm. he's a friend of the families, explains me and my father is that both of us have the ability to talk a starving dog off a meat truck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm writing that down. Starving dog. Off a meat truck. meat truck, yeah. So you know, you're born for it is is sort of what it comes down to. You know, th- there's a, there's a lot of talk about nature versus nurture, and um, you know, people struggling their whole life to find out what makes them tick. You re- you sounds like you're super fortunate to have a good grasp of that, um, or at least have that recognized in you by those around you to sort of help you stay on that track. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I talk to people who are just like, yeah, it took me 45 years, but then I figured out X or I had an epiphany that this is what I was supposed to do. Now, when you, when you, you, when your career at Hasbro came to an end, you, you might call that having that moment, you know, that a hundred percent, right. But for me, it was like, let go with severance gave me time, gave you time. And that was the kick, right? A lot of people get burned out or they're, they spend their, I'll give you a great example. I had a client who was a former 
CFO. And now he shows other CFOs how to get through all the CFO stuff and communicate with the with people the right way with a simple insight that more often than not, a business, if it's CEO, CMO, CTO, all those other ones, COO, yeah. they can all be young bucks. They can all be energy, vision, get it done. Mm-hmm. But a CFO is a sage, wise man. That's what you want on your side. You want that conciliar. You want Robert Duvall from The Godfather who's helping you guide your decisions. Yeah. You want someone with that wisdom and outside perspective that they can bring. Oh, yeah. That's how this guy started positioning himself, not only to show other CFOs what's important, but he became a fractional CFO based on that premise. Well, that makes sense. You know, people don't understand what the role of CFO really is, especially if you're not in, you know, in industry. Right. I, I have this really weird background where where I happened to work for the accounting industry for a while. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it's funny, like I was a recruiter when I first started my like my business life in Japan. I mean, I started off as a teacher, but I, I don't really count that as business. That was more like extended grad school in some ways. But then I, um, you know, I got into recruitment and, um, you know, I too was very high on the eye uh, for on the discs that when I took them earlier in, in my life and then I took them later, I was still high on eye, but different ways, you know, and anyway, like I always thought that it was that, inter- that, that personal interaction that was my strength. And, and, and I was right, you know, fu- fundamentally, I just didn't like selling very much, you know, well, um, more analytical. If it, let's say you gravitated towards numbers and analysis, that doesn't mean that you're not an outgoing yeah. person. There's just aspects of that, call it introversion yeah. of that more analytical and more, I need to yeah. think about this aspect. Well, well the, the funny thing is that I don't really have that analytical. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of analytical when it comes to marketing communications and looking at like, like I've really gotten into the idea that, you know, the, I've, I've embraced the digital world so that we can make decisions for marketing and communications that actually make serious sense, make serious sense. Yeah. And our leadership can say, holy crap, I can't believe I got that out of the comms team. You know, that's like my dream. When I, when I walk into a meeting and, and I'm, I'm talking to business leaders from across the organization and they, and they take me seriously. And yeah. I know that sounds a little neurotic. My, my whole life, you know, I've been in marketing comms roles and, you know, you're always proving yourself, but it's, it's nice to be in a, at a point in, a, in your life or in your career where like, I don't have to prove myself. I'm, I'm recognized as an expert in certain ways, at least in my company. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm adding value. It's fantastic. But yeah. my, yeah, but my, my point is right. That, that back in the, back in the day when I was just sort of coming up and like, I was, you know, I was, I was moving from recruitment into like, back office HR. I was like, this is miserable. Uh, and then like, I not no offense to HR people, it just wasn't my thing. And then I, I, I got into the accounting world as a communicator, right? <laughs> Which is a weird place to be. So there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, uh, of, of like intuitive connection people make, but the fact is that obviously accounting people need communicators desperately. It's a, it's a, it's a yin to their yang in some ways, but when you find those accountants who can communicate, right? Those are the guys and girls and you know people that seriously have amazing careers ahead of them. They were um, they are. Uh, although more and more, I think nowadays you're finding more and more people who are who understand that they need to have communication skills to get into that field. I don't you're doubt right? that. What I'm saying is, eighty percent is they would they don't like to communicate. Oh, totally. Oh, hundred percent. That is the twenty percent. Is what I that, that's right. You know and. But the CFOs, right, getting into the people who are in the business side of accounting and they're like, you know, they, they understand, maybe they have an MBA, maybe they don't, but like they understand how people within an organization interact with each other, but also they need to know like the, holistically what a business is up to. That you, you're right. You can't be like fresh out of school and do that. And Not accurately. You, no. And you need that, you need that kind of gravitas in some ways, but also a, a sense of humor and, and, you know, a, a, just a generally good communication capability to be able to be a good CFO and, a, and the consigliere. So I was, I was taking a very, very long way to agree with you on that point, but that's, you know, and but you're, well, you know, that's, it's it interesting. It actually goes to the idea of experience, right? Yeah. And you were just talking about this, where you go into an office meeting with the leaders across the organization and they take you seriously. 
if you didn't have the years under your belt of what you do, why would they take you seriously? Yeah, it's earned. It's earned. And that's what a lot of people end up seeing in there. A lot of people that I, that I talk to a ton of people every week. I get to meet new people from around the world every day. It's fascinating to me. But all of them have the same story. And so many of them are at a place where they want to start something or they have a small business, entrepreneur, even solo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's say a coach, okay? Do you know, uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, there was a pro beach volleyball player. Her name was Gabrielle Reese. Uh, oh, yes. I, I'm i a Gen Xer. I love Gabrielle Reese. That's why I figured you, because we're close enough that you'd know exactly. Oh, that. yeah. Yeah, I recall posters in my uh, fraternity house uh, yes. uh, to, uh, of Gabrielle Reese. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, she obviously was a phenom on the scene. Mm-hmm. She was a model. You know what she does now? What she do now? She coaches people on mental health and well-being. Because Good of for her. what she went through with all of the stuff that she had going on in her career, it took a toll on her. And now she's got a podcast or a, you know, a, a live stream you can, you can check out. But that's her focus now. And it's based on her experience over time. Our experience over time is what informs us on what's the right way or the logical way to, or the practical way to approach something. Go back to no experience, it's vision. It's Mm -hmm. I have an idea and I'm going to run through walls to make it happen. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But where people have that moment is not what, it's very rare that it's a 25 year old who's like, I had this epiphany, what I want to do. Yeah. Those are the people who, probably knew that when they were 14, you know, yeah. this, this yeah. is what I'm going to be when I grow up. And it's not an astronaut. It's running a, a, you know, a money market on wall street. Yeah. There are a few people like that, but for the bulk of us, what we do next or what we want to transition to that moment is driven by experience that we've had. And then there's a catalyst that kicks us into awareness, a uh, loss of, of like a, people get sick. And afterwards, they come out of it and say, I realized then, right? My life flashed before my eyes. Yeah. It doesn't have to be you're, you're sick or you have this trauma. For me, I got let go. And my response when they called my name was I hugged the vice president who called me into her office. Yeah, it, it's a gift. Some people have described it like that. Like th- that moment in time when things are changing, you know, you were, you were ready for it. You, you didn't have... A, a tremendous amount of joy sitting in an office, you know. So, nope. so, so it was. You were very. It came at the right time for you. Some people are caught by surprise, but then they end up like thinking. Most of them, like you know, what it was a gift. It was a gift, and I, I was able to then take a pause or turn my turn my life around. A good friend, Dave Armano, who um, who uh, is his um, he's at the beginning of the pandemic, he, the, um, he was at Edelman and Edelman downsized a little bit. And he was one of these very senior people in an awesome role. And, you know, he left the firm and he, and I think he was with them for so long that he just, you know, he was, didn't know what to do, but he ended up calling himself the chief pause officer at take a pause. Right. And he took a little bit of a break and he just examined the world. And the, that guy is one of the happiest people that I, I, I come across now. Right. So, you know, but back Back to you, Mike. So you had, you, we we had you uh, hugging your VP in the office. You know, you you got you um you like had that moment and clarity and freedom and clarity. And yes. where did that take you? It took me to a literal translation of what I thought I was good at: presentation mm-hmm. skills training. Okay. And mm-hmm. I was basically running workshops based on loosely titled "There's No Business Without Show Business." <laughs> which over time became a double-edged sword for me, or like a double-edged, double-sided message for me. What I looked at was how to get people comfortable in their own skin and, and present in a certain way. And it was, a lot of it was, was based on just what you do when you present, but none of it was based on, here's what you do with your hands. Here's where you look. Here's how you write your slots. Here's how you do this. Because I know, that if you give me more shit to think about when I'm in front of an audience, I'm going to lose it. Yeah. Hard enough. People rank public speaking over death and being struck by lightning. In As a fear. Afraid yeah. of. 
And it's all because we're the only living organism that has ego and free will. What are they going to think? Yeah. So I built my program around a simple construct of connect with the audience, direct them through the information in the right order and project the appropriate attitude, which is exactly what I was explaining to you at Nuremberg Toy Fair. It's an attitudinal adjustment. My personality isn't changing ever. Mm -hmm. I'm The only thing we have control over is our attitude. It's 10% what happens and 90% how we choose to react to it. But we're the only things that can make that choice. And it wreaks havoc when you're presenting. So what I would teach people is connection is about getting to a conversation. And you can apply it to anything, but I'll use a TED Talk as an example. 95% of TED Talks that you watch start with a question the speaker asks the audience. Why is twofold. One, for the audience, get them engaged from the jump and get them thinking. Sure. But the other side of that is that by seeing the hands go up, if they ask a question, how show of hands, let's say, by seeing the hands go up and by seeing people going, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Their brain is shifting from me versus them to us having a conversation. Yeah. It's the exact same premise as, oh, you went to this college. Do you know this person? Do you know this person? To someone that you just met. It's looking at how, oh, great weather we're having today, huh? It's a point of connection. Yeah. That's a point of connection that lets them get started into the conversation. So the first point, the first objective in a presentation, the connect. Then it's about what orders the information have to be in. And that becomes critical later in this conversation. Then it's, are you aligned the right way with the vibe that you're, that you need to give off your attitude, literally, in a lot of cases. You don't go into you don't go into a, oh, right, we're in financial crisis and start cracking jokes like, whoa, stock market, huh? No, no. Know the attitude of the room. So that's what I focused on. Pandemic kicks, it comes right when the business is taking off. Of course. Like as it is, always. A dollar contract to go and do 10 sessions in Atlanta type of thing. Yeah. On April 8th. <laughs> <laughs> so now yeah. I'm stuck with, I can do this over Zoom. At the time, Zoom was not what it is now. Squadcast was not getting the workout that it is now. Think right. About, like, this is how we communicate now. I would go to businesses in Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, and New York City for the most part. That was my hunting ground. Now I can't. But I also can't convince people that presentation skills can be taught and the same dread can be experienced on a platform like this than mm-hmm. it is in person. It was like pushing water uphill. They're yeah. like, no, we're putting it all on hold. I can't do that. I started my own business. It's starting to take off. It hits the first time in a century pandemic. Yeah. What am I going to do? So I said, what if I'm not talking about the audience in front of you? What if I take this same premise and apply it to any audience? Whether it's in a marketing campaign, whether it's a website, whether it's a presentation, I didn't care at that point. It could be an email. It's built around communication with another human being. That's what everything in business is based on. The problem that I had uncovered during the presentation skills phase of this and what I chose to focus on was when it comes time to talk about what you do, is your audience going to pick you out of a lineup? You could have the best solution in the world, but if they can't connect to it, if they can't perceive it as that, then your solution is meaningless. And that solution does not have to be conveyed in person in a presentation. It's right. conveyed you know, on your LinkedIn profile. How you talk about what you do to your audience when you're talking to your, not what you do to your audience. What, when you're talking about your business to your audience, The reality is you think 100% about what you do and what you focus on. The audience cares about five. I don't care if it's an internal pitch to the C-suite about a new piece of software that's been developed, or it's a sales pitch to someone, or it's your LinkedIn profile. The challenge is always you know everything. Mm -hmm. Finding that everything, finding 5%, the right 5% to get your audience's attention, keep it bring them through in the right order and get them to a decision point 
is really hard to do when you know everything. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting because you're hitting on a lot of points that obviously, you know, I've experienced in my career and that I've struggled with from time to time. And we all get into this habit of navel gazing where we think we are the best thing in the world and we've got the answers. So I'm just going to talk to you about my answers. I don't know what your problem is, but I'm going to talk to you about my answers because I'm interesting and because my answers are clearly what you need. But that misses that first important point, which you said earlier very clearly that connection is about getting to conversation. And I've I've now like, it, you know, sometimes the universe sort of starts to line up and, and you hear the same thing in different ways um, presented by amazing people and conversation, connection, connection, conversation. These are words that are together often. And um, like what I've, a, a good friend of mine who is just, who's writing a book now about to be published. It's about, you know, creating meaningful connections, uh, you know, across businesses uh, and with your customers, with your clients, out over social media, with because with, with connections, connection uh, with conversation, conversations. What makes those connections meaningful? I'm sorry, I will I will write the proper title in the notes. I promise, Brooke. But Brooke Salas is, is her name. But um, you know, it's it's all about you know connecting with a brand these days or a person. It's the same thing. You have to have a conversation, an exchange of information that's based on, you know, an interest and, and commonality and humanity. Value. Value. So that's... that's value is the leading edge of everything. So, so take us through it. So, you, you know, this is something, you know, you, you started off with presentation training, which is, you know, a natural kind of, I think, launching point for this. And the, mm-hmm. the, the pandemic pivot happened. Mm-hmm. So... You expanded that greatly, yep. um, and this is where we start to get into the whole idea of the of the, the elevator repairman that I talked about before. But yep. but it's a, you know that's a way oversimplifying. So, so it's building that relationship takes a certain time, it takes steps, and it takes an order. And that's that's one of the things that that I appreciate most about your model here is that there's an order to it. And I want to be clear before you get into it that there is an order, people. So <laughs> so. You know, so Mike, can you take us through this and how does, how does this connection happen in a meaningful way? So let's set the stage of the business and how they think first. Okay. Yeah. No business without show business was the name of my presentation skills training, but the truth of it, the reality of it is no matter what business you're in, you're playing a role. We don't think the same way in business that we do in our personal lives. We go to work, we clock in, we do what we're supposed to do. We come home, but Think about what's happening, even in just the meetings that you're in and the way things are talked about in that environment. You use words like ideate or synergize. You use acronyms like SaaS, software as a service. Mm -hmm. I learned that six months ago, by the way. (laughs) You use acronyms like SaaS, but you know why you use them? To make emailing easier. What are your KPIs for the business? Yeah, I hate that. Love that one. Let's say you and I just meet in Manhattan. I'm in New York for work. You come into town. We hit the White Horse Tavern or wherever, whatever bar to get a drink. And I'm like, listen, I got to go. I have to be up early. I got to get home before the weekend. Great to see you, man. So what are your KPIs this weekend? I would never in a zillion years say something like that to you. But in business, that's how we talk. Yeah. And everything we talk about is important to us. We see things through a simple perspective. What is the problem we are going to solve for our customer? Build that solution and tell them about the solution. It makes sense. If you create a service or product, you want to tell your audience about that service and the benefits to them. That's the nature of the beast. So does everybody else. Everybody is doing the exact same thing. Here's our services you should buy from us. Here's our product you should buy from us. This is good for you. Buy from us. They're bombarded with those messages constantly. And it's always services first because the company sees the service as the entry point. That's what they built as the solution. And every hour of their 40 a week is spent talking about that service and ultimately what they built. But let me give you the audience's perspective on all this. They can go on to Google. 
Google whatever kind of product they're looking for, and let's say it's bike tires and you sell bike tires, they're going to get 50 results in under a tenth of a second. And chances are they're going to skip over the ones that say ad. So there goes your big spend on SEA or SEM. Yeah. Okay. The next thing they're going to do is go to the organic search. And then all they have to do is click on one, look at it. If it's not grabbing them, hit the back button and go to the next one. That used to be a lot more complex. Yeah. Brands don't even know we're looking at them anymore. They can hope to. They can hope to capture something in their web reporting, but that's not going to help them. They spend their money on data scientists. Yeah. Data science. Why? SEM, SEO. We have to be at the top of the list so they click us. But if I have 50 options, I'm not committed. And they're right there. I don't have to get up and go to the next one or even turn a page. You know, and it's worth noting that it's even harder. Like it gets harder and harder. Google now, especially like often has no click searches. So, you know, you, when you put your, your query in, Google gives you a result and a blurb, everything you need in their own window. And you stay in the Google environment. You never leave Google. Right. And that's for, I don't know, I forget the number six or eight out of 10 searches end up that way. So, so devoting your time on search is really questionable these days. When Exactly. And I'm operating at that point in five to seven second increments of if it's right or not. Mm-hmm. Because all I have to do is go to the next result. Nope, not this one. Yeah. Nope, not this one. So let's apply that to a resume. And the typical employer engages with the resume. The average time is five to seven seconds. Fascinating. That jives with me. That jives. I, like, I think about my time as a recruiter. And I remember, like, you get a stack of resumes. You're like, eh. Eh, nope. Eh, oh. Nope. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yup. And when are you saying that? The first five to seven seconds. That's yeah. the first sentence. And you are not wearing a business hat in that moment, in those five to seven moments. You are reacting to the words somebody put on the page mm-hmm. as a human being. You are their audience at that point. If they intrigue you, you throw on your business hat and you read below the line and find out what kind of employee they would be. If your first five to seven second engagement on the resume results in being in that pile, being that you could be the best employer employee ever for them, they won't know it. Yeah. Because you didn't intrigue them enough to read below the line. And therein lies the problem that all the businesses that I work with tend to have. And what we're talking about here is yes, we have the, so we are where you should be. We have the service. Just give us a call. That's what they're relying on. Yeah. They're not thinking about the interaction of the person clicking on that result. And I'll tell you what's happening. I'll illustrate it for you with an example of a plumber. I put plumber into Google. I get 50 results. I now I'm clicking on them and looking for what I want. The first three results I click on say, we're a plumber. Here's our phone number. The fourth result says, if you're here, that means water escaped where it's supposed to be. Do not wait another second. Call us. We'll be there in 20 minutes. Wow. That's a good one. One of those is going to be memorable to me is the one that stands out as different. That one is different, not just because they said water escaped the system it's supposed to be in. They came across as different because my motivation for typing plumber into Google is that there's a plumbing problem a leak, a backup, whatever. And that never, ever waits. Light bulb to change, I'll get to it on Saturday. Oh man, I need a new piece of plywood for this or that. Eh, I can wait till April. Not a leak. You drop every damn thing. Yeah. And you jump into getting that solved. That is what I'm thinking when I'm looking for a plumber. That plumber knew it. And he told a story too. Like that's, it's a story he gave. Going through, water's where it shouldn't be. Yeah. Here's what the problem is with that. It's going to be costly. Yeah. Do not wait. Call us. They hit me. They hit everything. The head with a two by four based solely on what I'm thinking when I typed in plumber. They, they presented a journey, right? They, they said, they said like, here's where you, where you are. And, you know, it's not good, you know, uh, but you're lost there, you know, but there's, you know, but you're, you're in serious trouble. So here you have to call a, a plumber. It's a, it's a, it's a classic, you know, problem. 
uh, like statement problem solution. Like they get, they introduce conflict, and that's one way I think that that we connect with one another with these stories. It's a major st- way to connect with these with you know with storytelling. It's so important. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. You go. Well, I love I love storytelling. I just always what you're saying though. I, yeah. I just want to add to that. Yeah, that plumber doesn't have to alarm me to get my attention. Yeah, all they did was align with me. And you mentioned the journey. The way mm-hmm. I see a journey is not a storytelling motif. It's more yeah. of the, it's based on the idea of need state. If you were to plot just need state on a graph, it's a dot sitting on a graph without any lines or any other dots. Mm-hmm. 99 out of 100 businesses are thinking they're at this need state. I'm going to give them the solution now. Plumber, call mm-hmm. us, we're a plumber. You need a plumber, we're a plumber. I focus on the motivation to the need state. What is driving them? What is the journey to the need state, if you will? I come home, there's water flooding into my basement, let's say, or the sink is leaking, or the only toilet is backed up, or whatever that example is. What's the first thing I'm doing? Mm-hmm. I am dry. If I was going to make dinner, if I was going to go for a jog, all of that is gone now. All of it. That's the difference is the plumber stands out to me because they're telling me, let me guess why you're putting plumber in here. They're not you because you're not looking for a plumber. You're looking for the water safety up dripping and for my house to not be destroyed. That's right. You're looking for for that the journey, the motivation to the need state. Everybody thinks of it as that dot and what's coming mm-hmm. off of it is their solution. It's the wrong way to look at it if you want to get their attention first, if you want to connect with them. So what I've built around is the premise of the elevator pitch. Yeah. And it's a very familiar term, especially here in the US, it's second nature. What's your elevator pitch? In places like Europe, they may call it a, um, a networking pitch or a quick pitch, but the nature of it is the same. If someone asks you what you do, what do you say in response? In 30 seconds, if you're on an elevator, somebody says, so what do you do? What do you say? Yeah. The typical way that that's approached is, so what do you do? Oh, I'm an accountant. I I work for such and such. I own, and that is functionally exactly what it says on your business card, let's say. Mm -hmm. What you don't realize in that moment is what I'm hearing as as the audience and what I'm going to hold on to. I am not going to hold on to anything after Dan accountant Mm -hmm. because I think in terms of, I hold on to keywords. I don't hold on to everything. And if you set it with Dan accountant, Dan PR firm, I'm immediately, that's what I'm going to remember. Not everything else. You may as well say, and what do you do at that point? Mm -hmm. Because the conversation isn't going to happen. You've given me your card. That's not helpful yet. But, it, oh, and the other, I'm sorry, the other example that is common, but not as frequent, is the I help statement. Oh, right. I help business A going through challenge B achieve goal C by offering strategy D to get to all the- over LinkedIn, all over LinkedIn. That In one. 10 seconds, they're trying to tell me every, every single th- thing they do beginning to end. And I don't know what to listen to. I call it story brand Mad Libs. <laughs> <laughs> the booklet of Mad Libs and filled in the blanks, but didn't go through the process of what's really behind it. Because I, frankly, I think the story brand is great, um, but it's got to be applied the right way. In those instances, they're thinking, I've got it all out there. It's great. What the hell am I going to remember? I'm in networking groups of 30 people. If they're all saying I'm an accountant, I'm a masseuse, I'm this, I'm that, I help businesses do, I'm not going to remember any of it. People only remember three things. If there's 30 people in a networking group, I'm going to remember three of them on that day. I guarantee it. That's how we work. So combating that, that's 99%, 99 99.5% of what people think of as the elevator pitch. Oh, I miss and we do this and we are looking for this and blah, blah, blah. The audience doesn't remember. The audience remembers one of three things. To them, you have to be first, best, or different. That's it. That's what stands out. Go back to the 50 results in under a tenth of a second. What are they going to take away? If you see from the, you're on top of a building looking down into a courtyard, you see a sea 
of black umbrellas, <laughs> but one's red. How many umbrellas do you see? One. That's exactly how this works. The audience is looking for what's connecting with them. So I'm going to use the example of the PR firm and what and how we talk about this. An elevator pitch is not time-based. It's sequence of information. It's how do you get their attention? How do you connect with them and take them through what you do based on the order they need to know it? That's the secret of it. It's like a bunch of five-year-olds on the reading rug at the library, and you're the storyteller for that day. You are turning that book around and show you're learning how to read upside down because they're five. You need to show them the pages and say, see the cow jumping over the moon? Look at the dish running away with the spoon. And they're all going, yeah, yeah. The reason you're doing it is so they understand page four, so you could go to page five. They need to go in order and have perfect understanding within that order. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's how people think. So the nature of what I, I've built, and I, this is how I work with my clients, and I've created more of a, a course around it too, is based on the ride up an elevator. And the elevator is eight floors. And getting to each floor is predicated on getting them to say what you need them to hear next. Ask what, ask for what they need to hear next. So very simply, an example of connection. First floor, we get on an elevator together and I'm in PR and you ask me what I do. That'll be our scenario for this conversation. Yeah. Mike, what do you do? I could say, I run a PR firm. I issue press releases, something like mm -hmm. that. But what if I said, I make news when it matters? Now, I could be a reporter, a journalist. Yeah. I could be a number of things at that point. Maybe I'm an unruly celeb who ends up in the news. <laughs> <laughs> I could be a number of things to you. But the effect is, huh? Curiosity. I more. I need to know more. And it's, it's, it is, it's, it's a hundred percent curiosity, but it's basically addition by subtraction. If I tell you, I make news as a PR firm, elevator stopped again. You don't get to the second floor. Yeah. I don't need you to say, tell me more. So I don't want you to necessarily have the specific understanding of what I do based on the first thing I say. I show you how to talk about yourself is much different than I'm, I'm a marketing strategist who sits in his basement in Rhode Island. Yeah. So now I've got your attention and you say, tell me more. That's interesting. Okay, what do you mean make news when it matters? Second floor, businesses can't write their own news. Think about you trying to write about yourself in flowing terms. You can't do it. We can be <laughs> self-critical, but we can't write it from our own perspective. It effectively gives us writer's block. We can't find the words. Okay, so they have writer's block. What do you do for them? Third floor, solution. I find the words they can't to make sure the news has the impact they need it to have. That's effectively what a, what a PR firm does, right? Yeah, in the base, most basic level, we write and do, and do exactly that. Yes. Make news when it matters. Yep. They can't find the words. I get them out of writer's block. All right, so how do you do it? Fourth floor is my process, a very mm -hmm. important step. Because I can explain to you in three easy steps what I do over time, beginning to end, what you'd experience in a very simple way to understand. Discover the news you have to tell. Design the right way to tell it. Deploy it into the market for impact. It sounds like that's often what people put on the first floor, like by accident. More often than not, they're yeah. sticking to the fourth floor or the fifth yeah. floor. You know, but the key to explaining a three-step process is now, what do they get? What do I get? Like, what do you do for them? Mm -hmm. the process is your services. And that's the fifth floor. But the trick is your services do not look like a menu of options. Like at McDonald's, I'll have that and I'll have that and I'll have that. Your services are now couched like a three-course meal. Mm -hmm. Step one, discovery. This is what we're going to do. Step two, design. This is what we're going to do. Step three, deployment, this is what we're going to do. And it's the difference between if you've ever brought your car in to get fixed. Your car's not working correctly, you go to a mechanic. The mechanic has never, not once, said to you, come on in the garage and we're going to show you all the tools I have that I can use to fix your car. They say, let's put it up on the lift and get a look at what's going on. Step one, I'll give you a diagnosis and what it's going to take to fix it. Step two, we'll apply the tools we need get you back on the road as fast as possible. Step three, you know what's going to happen from the second you drive in to when you drive out. 
And I haven't told you anything about the services that I'm providing, but why do you care at that point? You want to know how it's going to get fixed. Same thing here. Fifth floor services now hang off of what you established on the fourth floor. Solution, here's how we arrive at that solution. Here's what happens in that process. How are they better off? Sixth floor benefits. Their challenge was this. Now that we've removed it, here's what they can do. Not just it's gone. Here's what it allows them to do. That's the benefits. Do you have any proof to back it up? Have you worked with other people on this? Seventh floor, validation. Case studies, testimonials, social proof that it works. Eighth floor, do you have a card? Because you've given them the sequence. Take that elevator and and invert it now. This is what it sounds like on a one-sided conversation. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. What do you do? That's interesting. Tell me more about that. So how do you help them? How do, what do you do for them? Yeah. How do you get to that solution? How, do, how does it work? And what are you doing with them in that time? What are they better? What can they do now? Like do they got that out of the way. What can they do? Have you worked with anybody else that you could share? Yeah, let's set up a meeting. Natural. That is how a human being would ask questions to elicit information to get to a decision. It's not unlike a frequently asked questions page. Starts with the most general, goes to the most specific, detailed. It goes in a funnel like this because that's how people are going to ask questions. They're not coming out of the gate saying, what do you do? Here's my services. But that's what almost all of us do. The first thing we want to talk about is the solution we created for their problem. Yeah. They don't see it that way. They see it as clutter. They see it as the black umbrellas. Yeah, you, want, you want to go out there and say, I got skills. I know how to do this. I'm an expert. Trust me. Here's the th- great things that I can do. And, and that's, you know, uh, you, you, a lot of people are like, think they think that that is the most redeeming fig- feature about themselves. And, and they want to get in front of the other person like right away. And I'm, you know, I've done that a lot in the past and, you know, you, it's, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're left, you're left thinking, how come they don't see it? How come they don't get yeah. it? And here's a great example of that exact thought process. We talked about somebody becoming a coach or consultant let's say, mm-hmm. based on experience. And this is what I can bring to people. That's their motivation. That's passion. Yeah. You no, know? that's intellect and experience, but it's passion. I want to share it. What do they do? They write a book. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people who have written books. Invariably, it's the first thing they put on their website. Unless you're Stephen King or Danielle Steele, I don't care that you wrote a book yet. Mm-hmm. To me, that's validation. That's seventh floor. That's getting into call to action. You can read about it all right here. I wrote a book on it. Yeah. But they don't believe that book until you've led them through the importance of what's in it. So why does everybody who wrote a book, coach, consultant, whatever, put it at the top of their website? Because they want to shout from the rooftops what they know how to do. Yeah. It's human instinct. I and they've been, they've been inculcated that way, right? They, they've been told that, hey, when you create a product and you want it to sell, you got to put it in front of people. And the best place to put it in front of people is where they see you. You know, these, these, it's like all of a sudden we are, we're each a, a supermarket uh, a checkout counter and you have a point of sales, you have a, a, a point of sale display, yeah. you know, and that's the old, old, very old school way of, of, you know, class classic, uh, marketing and, you know, Hey, it, it, it worked for, you know, today's special, uh, products, but you're, you know, if it's, if you're trying to sell or, or even make a connection with somebody based on anything deeper, I mean, and now nowadays, how buying a book, that's a commitment, right? I mean, I, it's not a price thing, right? If you get to a certain point in your career, I hope you can buy books. It's really about time. And look, I'm going to make a commitment to learn what this person has to say. I have to know that it's worth it. Um, and I have to really want to know more about why, about what this person has to say. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny when you connect with somebody for the first time. It's like, oh, they're an author, right? Um, okay. Best selling author. Eh. <laughs> like I have an idea of what a best selling author is just because you say it doesn't mean it's convincing me your audience. You no, know? I mean, I, I admire, like it automatically tells me, okay, this person likely has a good worth work ethic and has really worked hard on Without something. And that's, that's, that's terrific. And I, I share that they wrote a book. Yeah. 
that's a big undertaking and it means yeah. the meaning, right? But the reality is, unless I know the meaning of what's in the book, I'm not going to buy it because you don't have the name. You don't yeah. pay top dollar to see a no name band at Madison Square Garden or at some venue, you know? Yeah. You know the reputation of or you follow them. That's a lot different. You can't start there and say, I yeah. wrote a book, read it. What's in that book can help people, absolutely. But what sells the book is the blurb. Yeah, the validation and the one, right? The story. Blurb. They don't read the first page. That won't help. They don't read the whole thing. That's ridiculous. They read the three paragraphs on the inside flap. Now, let's go back to why it's so hard for businesses to do this. Yeah. Sticking with the blurb uh, motif for the theme, let's say you are a famous author like Stephen King. Mm -hmm. And Stephen King writes the next horror novel. And it's going to be a blockbuster or whatever. 400 pages. Now it comes time to write the blurb. There's no way he can do it. Yeah. Because he knows every single detail. He knows the environments. He knows the clothes people are wearing. He practically hears scary music writing what's going on. He knows every detail. How in the world is he supposed to write the three paragraphs that are going to sell it? You know what he does? He gives it to someone else to read. A blurbist, if you will. (laughs) But he gives it to someone else to read to extricate what people need to understand. They have a fresh outside perspective. Apply that to business. I can see things in a business that a business can't see simply because a business is worrying about everything. And all I'm thinking about is 5%. If you start a business, it's based on, I have this vision to build towards this. That's a straight line before you start. 100% vision driven. When it comes time to do it, to build it, what do you run into? I'm going to start a company. Well, I need a website. I need a URL. Oh, I need an accountant. I need this. I need that. Oh, and I have to sell and I have to market and I have to do the work that I bring in. When the hell are you going to think about how to straighten it all out? Yeah. You are stuck in everything. It creates a fog. That outside perspective gets you out of that fog simply by not being in it in the first place and seeing what the whole picture is. There's such value in that. I mean, it's your business. Tremendous value in that too. Like there's, there have, in my time, I've, I've certainly worked with people who did not see the value of working with outside consultants, outside agencies for something as simple as writing uh, about the company or for something as simple as creating a web page, you know, we're talking back in the day, but Mm -hmm. you know, the smarter leaders would say, get out of your own way. You're too close to it. We need fresh eyes. We need other opinions. We need to to know what the, what the market's going to think, you know? So it's really important. They may not be right, but even if, even if we get advice, that's not right. That's still important to know. We can eliminate something from this, from, from our, you know, from our, uh, our, our options and, our um, assumptions. our assumptions, <laughs> you know, and, and you don't want it, you don't, you don't want it, that to happen. You want to hit it, hit it out of the park with the first consultant or agency you work for. But the fact is right. There's value in everything. And, um, you know, I, I totally agree. You need to, you need to have a, somebody who's outside of it often to really be able to, to encapsulate what you're going for. Right. Exactly. I mean, if you write, 20, like a 20 page article or, you know, booklet. Let's mm-hmm. And I hand you page nine, you know exactly what it means. But if I hand someone else page nine, they have no idea what it means because they haven't seen page one through eight. There is no value in it to them until you lead them to that value. That's the issue. And with all the choices, that idea of standing out for the right reasons It doesn't mean you have to dress like a clown and spin a car wash sign on the corner to say, hey, look at me, I'm different. People try that all the time. I saw a very funny instance. I was in a big, like 60 people in this networking thing. One of them is dressed as straight up like a a United Airlines pilot. And his background, his virtual background is a cockpit. And I'm like, I can't wait to hear this guy talk. Yeah. Yeah. And the first thing he does is he pulls out the sound changer. And he's like, folks, this is your captain speaking. And he pulls in <laughs> the whole thing. I had to go back and find out what the guy does. Yeah. He's a web 
That's How am I amazing. supposed to remember that when he's reminding me of one of the pilots on the plane in the movie Airplane? I'm not yeah. going to take that away. I'm going to remember there was some guy dressed as a pilot. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Being remembered for the wrong thing, being different in a way that doesn't matter, just yeah. for different sake isn't going to work. It's understanding that the audience needs to understand the story in the right order. Yeah. And if you're leading with, I wrote a book, here's my killer full stack app feature that's going to change your business. Here's how you get back on track in your life. No matter what that is, you need it to connect with me from my perspective, not yours. And that's what every business struggles with. It's um, it's a problem that's not going away anytime soon either, is it? I mean, luck- luckily for your business, I mean, you, you're you're in demand and in high need to help people with this. Um, and by the way, the book that uh, that uh, that I just because I was talking about about uh, Brooke Sellis earlier, and I just want to really get back because she the title of her book is conversations that connect. And I just wanted to make sure that I didn't bastardize it too much because it's a good, that's exactly what this process is about. It's about that initial conversation. It's about a longer conversation between you and your audience that connect that, that, that forge a connection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that's the issue is this, this conversation point. It's, it's that the humanity, it's the, it's the, Give and take, um, the inspiring curiosity. Um, you know, it's knowing when to walk away. It's also knowing when to read the room. There's, you know, your eight steps, your eight floors have elements of all of this. And, um, I, I just, I think it's, I mean, frankly, I think it's brilliant because it just, it, 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 it it illustrates a journey and at every step of the way, it just kind of makes sense. But I imagine people fall off at different stages too. Right. So Like yeah. trying to figure out when it's your business, trying to figure out without a roadmap to do it. Okay, well, easy to say. Yeah, it's about do this, connect and challenge and solution. And it's easy to say, but when I need to start doing it for my business, I'm going to keep gravitating to services really early. Mm-hmm. And everyone I talk to, when they tell me what they do, they tell me all about the experience of when I'd be working with them. Yeah. That's services. Like I, I don't need to know 95% of what you just told me is the reality of what your audience is hearing. Yeah. And I'll give you a, this is a, a perfect example of what I'm talking about. In my time at Hasbro, when I was working there, especially on the games division, we would have, we would put work out to, to uh, agencies all the time. And we'd put out an, a request for a proposal. Let's say. Mm-hmm. Well, in this instance, I picked four agencies, production heavy, like we were talking about content for the most part. So four companies to come in and present based on one challenge that I sent them, one objective, increase our presence on social media, both paid and organic. Broad. Right? Yeah. I picked four agencies, handpicked. The first three agencies come in and give me their capabilities. Us, there's 10 people in the room, their capabilities deck. We're this agency, here's our team, here's our offices, here's our philosophy, here's work we've done, here's accolades we've received. And I'm sitting there going, you you just told me every single thing that's on your website in the same order. You came in and regurgitated what I saw initially to send you the, I sent you a challenge, you didn't address it once and it's been 35 minutes. Yeah. Fourth agency, this is all on the same day. Fourth agency comes in, or maybe they were second. It doesn't matter. Last agency that I'm going to speak to comes in. And he puts on the, on the screen our exact wording of our challenge. This is what you told us you want to accomplish. Then he takes out his phone. He starts moving his thumb like he's scrolling content on his th- phone. And he says to him, we can already see what he's doing. He says, what does this mean to you? All 10 of us are going scrolling our phone. He goes, so what does this mean? And he stops his thumb very deliberately so we can see it stops his thumb. What does it mean when you do this? We saw something that stopped us from going to the next thing that caught our attention. He goes, what's behind me on this wall is not your objective. Your objective is to stop the scroll. We were eating out of the palm of his hand and he was two minutes in. Brilliant. That, I and love that. Here's yeah. how I'd solve that challenge. 
Then he went to businesses he's worked with and work he's done to validate it. Mm -hmm. And then said, step one is let's sit down and do a deep dive. That's where we'd start. And here's what we yeah. we got it immediately. Because he had us thinking like the customer. What are they doing is a lot. De- they are not thinking, oh, Hasbro really increased their presence, both paid and organic on social media. They're thinking, oh, that My Little Pony is dope. Yeah. Very different perspectives. Very different perspectives. That's a great example. Yeah. And that agency showed us the perspective of the audience while the other three showed us their pitch, their sales presentation. Yep. I've been in plenty of pitches and, you know, the agencies should follow this eight step program, uh, uh, you know, to, to get their pitches through. Cause it's not just for an elevator pitch. It's just a, the, the way you establish a conversation and answer the query in a natural order. I mean, you know, Actually, I'll take it even you're right. It isn't just your elevator pitch. Yeah. Because if you go through those eight floors and the logic behind it, the common sense and humanity behind how they need to, what order of information you have my attention and now I'm following the story. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Your ability to do that in a networking call and a sales pitch, that exact same message. And this is the beauty of what, what I create with my clients is the only way that you need to talk about yourself. It is the one way to talk about yourself. So if it's a one minute presentation to someone you meet on an elevator, like conversation and networking event, whatever, if it's your website, if it's your LinkedIn profile, it should all follow this format because it breeds consistency across all of your communication. It always stands out as different based on the way you've constructed it. And it creates remarkable efficiency in marketing. If you know what to say and exactly who to say it to, you know where to put it. Yeah. So that one elevator pitch idea becomes your audience blueprint for how you talk about everything you do. And it's the exact same order in every place. If you change that order, I call it the slinky effect. A slinky is like this or 40 yeah. feet long, right? Mm-hmm. It's compressed or stretched out. This could be a one minute conversation, elevator pitch. Mm-hmm. This could be exactly what's on your website. Maybe it takes four minutes to go through for somebody, but it's saying the same thing. It's just adding a little more content, right? Mm-hmm. Or it could be a one hour seminar presentation. Yeah. But it's always in the same order and it never changes order. Like a slinky, if you tangle it up even once, that thing doesn't work anymore. It's bent. You can't get it undone. The coils are screwed up. It's not the same. Yeah. You need to keep it in order because your audience always thinks like a human being. They don't think like a business. I think it's ridiculous that the word SaaS shows up in any marketing communications as a headline. I think right. it's weird. But it's a holdout from an abbreviation in email, Dan. Yeah. That's made its way into marketing. <laughs> well, marketing is where <laughs> all terrible... Know about how a business thinks. Yeah, I mean, marketing is where all ter- 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 terrible words go to live, uh, yeah. never mind to die. I mean, it's like, that's... I take that on uh, on us as a profession that we've dropped the ball with uh, with being able to speak like humans, which is why we need these kinds of these reminders that conversation in a natural and logical order is critically important to building relationships and building trust. And it's trust that yields the business. It's trust that yields the next level of connection. You know, everything is based in that. And you can't work with somebody. You can't hire somebody or you can't hire them for long if some of those pieces are missing, you know, because you'll slip into those gaps and, and it's not going to work out. You, know, you um, have a conspiracy theory on why it's like this? Yeah, I'd love to. All right. We're going to talk about pre-Amazon and post-Amazon. Pre-Amazon, a brand would say, trust us, you need what we have. Amazon comes along and introduces ratings and reviews. They're the first to do this. Yeah. Okay. Now, any brand that comes to you on Amazon says, you need what I have, trust me. I'm saying, "Ah, let me see what these 400 people had to say. And how come you only have a four-star rating? And all of a sudden, it's like the business is like, what am I being investigated? Am I being questioned? Like it's turned back on them. Yeah. And that all came from the ability for consumers to talk to each other about a product. That's Mm -hmm. the door, the Pandora's box that Amazon opened up. Now apply it to the agency world and marketing world now. 
and brand world now. Mm -hmm. What I was talking about maybe 20 minutes ago, ad agencies are not populated by people with wonderful ideas of how to bring a TV commercial to life. They're full of analysts who are afraid to present their work. They're full of people who are trying to understand the data behind everything. Yeah. So that they can move up a search rank. We were trying to do that at one point. And this is what I'll close with in terms of outside perspective, okay? I've been talking at you enough. We had a product that we were trying to figure out what is, imagine this, let me set the stage, 13 grown ass adults around a table discussing the right SEO terms for the new feature Elmo. <laughs> like dance with me, Elmo, tickle me, Elmo. Let's say this one, sing with me, Elmo. I don't even remember yeah. what we did. But the point is, we're sitting around talking about what are the search terms? Sing with Elmo, sing mm -hmm. this and this and this. There's a design intern who's there doing his work study over the summer or whatever. Sitting on the outside of the group, just his boss is in there, something like that. Can I ask a question? And we're all like, yeah, go ahead. Almost, you know, the, the head guy was almost like, let's go. Yeah. Conversation, hurry up. Says, well, Ma, you just put your kids that this kid's 22 years old. Okay. Yeah. You just put your kids down in front of Sesame street and go do other stuff. Right. You don't sit there and watch with them. Right. You're like, yeah, of course. Like do the dish. Yeah. 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 What's your point? Well, how do you find out about Elmo then? Well, they come and tell us. Okay. So how old are they? Two, three. Yeah, probably. Well, when they come to tell you what, about it what do they say like don't they just pull on your leg and go ma i want elmo i want elmo and we're going yeah what's your point so isn't mom just gonna search new elmo and we're all going what is that whole oh shit, you're absolutely right <laughs> we are 13 adults sitting around a table trying to figure out these keywords and it took somebody from completely outside the conversation who has zero background on it to point out the simple reality that mom is never going to search sing with me elmo yeah it's gonna search elmo from her two-year-old yeah <laughs> that was it and, and and that's precisely why you need to have the perspective of different audiences of of people who are not in your circle mm -hmm. uh, you know I, it, it happens all the time and I, I appreciate you sharing that story and i know that we've been talking for a long time i really normally uh you know i'm I lose track of time on, my, on these things anyway. This time I really have, but I don't care. It's been a great conversation. There's been so much value in talking to you, Mike. And you know your process for, for the elevator pitch, the pitch, the conversation, the business communication, you know, whatever you have at the website, everything is, is really, I think, an excellent blueprint, a good framework to follow. You, know, you can plug in a lot of things I've talked about on my show in the past. Like we, I've had... Um, uh, Park Howell to come here and talk about the uh, ABT method of storytelling, right? And but therefore, you can plug that in in any number of ways along that journey and keep people engaged by presenting, you know, a a a conflict and a resolution at every step where you keep them kind of glued to the to the TV, as it were, you know. And um, well, it there's glued to cave walls, but it was based in the same premise. Same premise, exactly. Someone it's through a story in the right order is imperative. And every business, every opportunity you have to communicate out what you do is exactly the same thing. Yeah. And, and you can't buck nature, uh, at least at least you don't want that bent slinky. I love that analogy because, you know, you can't put that thing back together. But listen, Mike, it's been a fantastic conversation. I'm so happy to have had you on. There's a lot more I want to talk about with you. But right now, I think um, we'll, uh, we'll send people if they want to hear more about what you do and about um, your, your, your method and your approach. They should find you on LinkedIn. Look for Mike Verrett. It's V-E-R-R-E-T. It'll be spelled properly in the episode title. Go to verrettandassociates.com and it's spelled exactly like I've said it. Um, and uh, verrettandassociates.com. Check out his uh, masterclass that's that's up there as well. Um, it is just like, it's a it's pleasure. Not, not even a masterclass. It's a course. A course. It's Sorry. 35 minutes of video in a workbook called the Elevator Pitch Repair Manual. The elevator pitch repair man, which is why I grabbed the elevator pitch repair man out of that. Um, but, um, but I'll tell you, you, you can't, 
uh, get enough value out of this. I think it's just it's just a tremendous method, especially for anybody who has to communicate for a living. And I think that's everyone, to be honest with you. So, uh, Mike, uh, any last words? I can't imagine having to add to the number that I've already said. But what I do want to say is thank you eternally. I love these opportunities to talk about what I do. You could probably hear the passion in it. Oh, uh, totally. Me coming coming off of me when I'm talking about it, but. It, it's based on experience. It's based on that moment I had. And it's based on how I choose to position that outside perspective to my clients. And that perspective is everything. So I appreciate you letting me uh, letting me share it with your audience. Love sharing my platform with great people. So thanks so much, Mike. And, um, you know, uh, everybody, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>